Hot Jupiters are the most thoroughly investigated category of exoplanets because their orbital periods are so short. They go around their star every few days instead of every few years, and that just makes them much easier to study. We know of about 100, maybe some, something more than 100 hot Jupiters. We also know that they're somewhat rare. If you pick a random star like the Sun, uh, maybe one out of every 200 will have a hot Jupiter. Um, one thing that's the, the, the biggest puzzle of the hot Jupiters is just why they exist at all. According to our best theory for how a giant planet like Jupiter should form, you have to start with a lot of solid material that exists in the early days after a star is first formed, the sort of leftover material from star formation. And all that dust and, and, and gas exists in a disk that surrounds the young star. And over time, that dust tends to collide, those dust grains tend to collide with one another to form larger particles. And those larger particles collide with one another to form grains of sand, which come, become into rocks and pebbles and boulders. And eventually, you get an object that's comparable in size to a planet, say, a few times the Earth's mass. And at that point, if you've managed to grow that large, the gravity from that growing protoplanet is strong enough to start vacuuming up all of the gas in the surrounding region, all of the hydrogen and the helium, and you very quickly swell up to become a giant planet like Jupiter or Saturn, which is mostly made of hydrogen and helium, and which at most just has a small core of rocky material on the inside. Now, that, according to that story, that should only happen in the far reaches of a star system, not close in. And the reason is that you need it to be cold enough for things like water and methane and ammonia to exist in solid form as opposed to as vapor. If they exist as solids, you just have a lot more material to pack onto your growing protoplanet. If you're very close to the star, where it's thousands of degrees Celsius, you don't have nearly as much solid material. And all of the orbital motions are much too fast for these things to collide and stick together. So we have some very good theoretical reasons to believe that you cannot form a giant planet very close to a star like the Sun, and yet we see that they're there. So how did that happen? Well, the way that theoreticians have reacted, mostly, is to say, yes, we did form that giant planet far away from the star, but then something happened. Something caused its orbit to shrink to where we see it today. And what is it that happened? Well, there are a lot of possibilities, and we don't know which is correct. One possibility is that that growing protoplanet, which is way off in the far reaches of the star system, has a gravitational interaction with that disk of gas and dust that still surrounds a young star for the first few million years of its life. And that gravitational interaction has the form that the planet causes density waves to appear in this disk. And those density waves have their own gravity which acts back on the planet, and through a mechanism that's not at all obvious and that was not predicted in advance, does cause the planet to spiral inwards over time and eventually take up a very tight little circular orbit. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is completely different and goes like this. Suppose that by chance the star has a lot of material surrounding it and forms not just one giant planet, but three or four giant planets in a configuration that turns out to be unstable. So that over time, those giant planets are orbiting the star, but they have close encounters with one another. Their gravity pulls and pushes on one another, changing their orbits in such a way that one of those giant planets might get ejected altogether from the system or thrown out to an even more distant orbit, and the other one gets thrown onto an orbit that takes it at one end very close to the star, just by chance. And if that happens, once a planet gets on a very elongated orbit, one end of which is close to the star, then when the star and, and planet approach each other closely, the tidal forces between the planet and the star become very strong. The star and the planet pull on each other very intensely. And over time, those tides act effectively as friction. They cause energy to be lost from the system. And when you drain energy out of a highly elongated orbit, it shrinks and circularizes. 
And so maybe that's where hot Jupiters come from. They're evidence of previous violent encounters between giant planets that happen rarely, but commonly enough for us to detect them in abundance. People have been wondering about whether exoplanets exist for, well, as long as uh, there have been scientists and philosophers. Um, more specifically, people have been searching with modern types of telescopes over the last uh, 50 to 75 years. It's just that it seems so daunting a problem uh, to try and detect a planet like Jupiter or, or especially a planet like the Earth that it never really had much traction among professional astronomers. It was considered a sort of flaky subject, something um, much too speculative and risky to bet one's career on. But still, there were some brave pioneers who decided to devote their careers to finding exoplanets, or at least um, attempting to find exoplanets, who embarked on long-term surveys, generally using the Doppler method, the method by which one tries to sense the motion of the star around the center of mass to detect planets. And they thought they were in for a very long journey. They thought that they were looking for planets like Jupiter that went around every 12 years. And so that in order to catch a full orbit, they had to um, be expected to wait decades for the, um, to have conclusive evidence that they were looking at a planet. It turned out, though, that in the, in the mid-1990s, uh, the field was really electrified. The huge stimulus was provided by a group in Geneva led by Michel Mayor and Didier Calot, who announced the discovery of a giant planet in an extremely close orbit, one that took only a few days to complete. This was uh, announced in an atmosphere of extreme skepticism, I would say, among astronomers, uh, because it seemed too good to be true that planets could exist in such easy-to-study, convenient orbits, and because we had all of these theoretical reasons to think that such planets could not exist. On the other hand, uh, a pair of American astronomers, Jeff Marcy and Paul Butler, were able to confirm very quickly the discovery of the Geneva team, and that lent a lot of confidence to both sets of results. And then quickly after that, both teams started discovering dozens and then even hundreds of these exoplanets and made it very clear that this was not just a fluke, this is not just a, a one in a galaxy kind of phenomenon, but that most stars, in fact, have exoplanets. Another puzzle that's raised by the hot Jupiters concerns their sizes. A lot of them are the same mass as Jupiter, but significantly larger in diameter, sometimes 20, 30, even 50 percent larger than Jupiter. And we don't know why. This apparent bloating of these gaseous planets has presented a puzzle for more than a decade. Some theories involve the absorption of the large amount of heat that's coming from the star and that's being transferred into the interior of the planet, causing it to bloat up. Other theories are different. They involve a more electrical and magnetic interaction between this orbiting planet and the extended ionic atmosphere of the star. And in order to clear up that question, probably the best approach is to enlarge our sample of giant planets that are not necessarily hot Jupiters, that are further away from the star, and study the sizes and masses of those planets. And if we see that it's only the closest in planets that are especially bloated, then we'll know to look toward the heat, the excess heat, or the excess ionic environment as the key factor in enlarging those planets. We would like to check, in other words, that cold Jupiters have the sizes that we expect and are not especially bloated. One interesting thing about the hot Jupiters is that we know that their orbits, are, their orbital geometries, can be very interesting. Some of them are found to be on orbits that are highly tilted with respect to the equatorial planes of their host stars. And in fact, we now know of several hot Jupiter systems that are rotating backwards compared to the rotation of their parent stars. This we take, at least at face value, as evidence that these planets had some kind of interesting gravitational encounters in the past, that they were thrown around by near collisions 
or gravitational effects of other planets in the system that cause their orbits to be scrambled, in a sense. But we can't be completely secure in that conclusion until we also examine the geometries of more normal giant planets and can confirm that when you have a giant planet that's in a more normal orbit, that it is in that same pattern we see in the solar system, that it's going around in the same way as the star is rotating. And that's something we're working on now, is to try and measure the geometry of the orbits of more distant planets. It's more difficult to do. The, the close-in planets are much easier to study. They're more convenient because everything happens much more quickly. But the frontier is really reaching out to more distant, cooler, more normal-seeming planets.